with dutasteride, you have relatively equal amounts. So let's say that all the buckets are halfway full. So it's an easier thing for your body to self-regulate. In addition to that, you're gonna be able to take a lower dose and get a better response while affecting the type of 5-alpha reductase that's in the liver. There's actually two types that's going to be converting your progestogenic neurosteroids. Um, so we mentioned earlier, you, know, you mentioned there's, you know, I know there's a handful of studies that show dutasteride causes less side effects than finasteride. And, and this is kind of bizarre to me. Mm -hmm. It's not incredibly well understood. I know there's some preclinical data supporting a neuroprotective effect and yep. anti-inflammatory effect with dutasteride. But, you know, what's your theory as to why dutasteride would seem to cause less side effects, even though it is a more potent medication on paper? lowering DHT more in the serum scalp, presumably everywhere. Yeah, um, it's important to understand that the usual dosing of dutasteride for BPH is generally uh, 0.5 milligrams every single day. And that is not really a comparable dose to even five milligrams of finasteride um, for many reasons, but the main reason being that it inhibits all three isoenzymes of 5-alpha reductase. And on paper, you would think that this would be a detriment to dutasteride because your serum DHT is more likely to go lower. However, there is several papers, um, many different, I suppose, uh, correlation, but not causation of there not being that of post dutasteride syndrome or dutasteride side effects being much more rare in eugonadal individuals. And my theory behind this is if you look at the three different isoenzymes, um, the concentration in different cells, specifically the intrachronology of it, as Dr. Fernand Labry would say, um, you look at the DHT in each of those buckets. So pretend that you have three different buckets here and then the serum is just the pipe that connects them. So you're not as much worried about the level of DHT in the pipe that connects them, but the level of DHT in all three buckets. So let's say you're on an equitable do dose, maybe uh, 0.5 dutasteride once a week, maybe twice a week, and one milligram of finasteride a day. Your serum DHT decreases 65%. So the DHT in the pipe is equally lower, but the DHT in your genital skin is much lower. The DHT in um, you know, your non-genital skin is much higher in finasteride. Say that this one's almost completely empty and this one's almost completely full in finasteride that's gonna make it much more difficult for your body's many uh, negative and positive feedback inhibitions to alter things like androgen receptor density um, or even 5-alpha reductase activity. Um, but with dutasteride, you have relatively equal amounts. So let's say that all the buckets are halfway full. So it's an easier thing for your body to self-regulate. In addition to that, you're gonna be able to take a lower dose and get a better response while affecting the type of 5-alpha reductase that's in the liver, there's actually two types, that's going to be converting your progestogenic neurosteroids. So there's a lot of different reasons why dutasteride is um, generally better tolerated, and that's just my theory on why it is. And anecdotally, we have certainly seen this as well. Yeah, and this reminds me of the dopamine wave pool, except now there are three wave pools, or I suppose you could think of it as you have you know, three hot springs and dutasteride will keep all of those at the same temperature. Yep. Uh, but if you're taking finasteride, maybe two of those are lukewarm and one is freezing cold and that's your genital skin that's freezing cold. Um, and we know that the body does adapt. Like you know, dopamine is a hormone. Mm -hmm. I know some people don't think of it that way, but yep. it is, it's a neurotransmitter hormone and your body does rebalance when you have high levels or low levels. So. You know, I can imagine a situation like just like a tri-level home, you're not going to have the same temperature in each of those zones, you know, corresponding with the three, you know, um, subtypes of, you know, the three isoforms of 5-alpha mm -hmm. reductase and then the subsequent tissue expression. So I think it's a really interesting theory and it seems to match some anecdotal data. Um, but, you know, it, I don't think we're quite scientists, can't say for sure, but uh, it's one of the more compelling things that, you know, I've heard that you and I have talked extensively about too. So to talk about side effects, because we, we kind of mentioned, you know, there are side effects, but 
what do those things look like? I think that's the last um, point that we wanted to make about the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. You know, what should people you know, watch for or what is common and, and who's more likely to get side effects? Mm -hmm. So there's both negative and positive side effects. For example, for dutasteride, um, potentially um, preventing left ventricular hypertrophy or LVH would be one of the side effects if that's something that an individual is prone to. But uh, other side effects, especially of dutasteride, basically mimic hypogonadism and mimic postpartum psychosis and postpartum depression. So postpartum psychosis and depression is related to a um, sharp decrease in what I call the progestogen pool, pregnenolone, progesterone, DHP, and THP. And we treat this with uh, IV THP for severe cases of postpartum depression, psychosis, suicidal ideation, et cetera. And um, it is possibly something that can be utilized with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like DHP and or THP in the future. But um, you don't want to just get on a prescribing cascade. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, kind of like the, the finasteride side effect spectrum, we describe as an x-axis and a y-axis. One axis is more genitourinary side effects. One axis is more neurologic side effects, which can include an imbalance in sympathetic and parasympathetic drive, like a fight or flight, rest and digest. And then it can also include uh, things like, uh, we just mentioned them, <laughs> postpartum psychosis, anxiety, depression, et cetera. So that's the way that we see it, and that's the way that, way that we kind of treat all of those things on an individual basis where there's not one specific regimen. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that earlier, well, I, I say this year, it was actually 2022, I believe, when the um, FDA has you know, placed a warning label on finasteride for suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. um, just due to the post-marketing attempts and you know, people in the advocacy groups for post-finasteride syndrome. Yep. Um, it is very important to realize the potential side effects of any medication, including finasteride, including dutasteride, including testosterone. Um, but uh, knowing that many people take these medications and have noticeable side effects, some people take the medications and have unnoticeable side effects, and some people do take the medications, perhaps they're a good candidate for it, and they truly do not have any side effect. So there's people in all three groups and kind of like um, skewing uh, opinion to where uh, everybody has side effects on finasteride or nobody's side effects on finasteride um, is just kind of an example of uh, anecdotal and observer bias. Well, I suppose we should rate these medications on the Norwood scale as well. What do we rate uh, finasteride and dutasteride? I give finasteride a Norwood one. I give dutasteride a Mature hairline. That sounds pretty good to me. Uh, I would rate them the same.